Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the OSC panel on victim-centered approaches to investigations and prosecutions. My name is Chris Toth, and I'm with the Executive Committee of the International Association of Prosecutors in The Hague, and I also am with the National Association of Attorneys General in the USA. Before we get started, I'd like to make a few technical announcements. First of all, please remember to ensure that your microphone is muted and your camera is disabled at all times, except when taking the floor. Please know that interpretations are available in six languages. And should you have an issue with interpretation or any other technical issue, Zoom participants can contact the ICT host via the chat. Whether you're on Zoom or you're at the Hofburg, please know that you can register to take the floor to make short interventions and ask questions to our panelists. Registrations for taking the floor are recorded with OSCE staff and uh, who is Alexander Karolenko, who will communicate you with a chat message. Just say that you request, uh, you have a floor request. In order to allow sufficient time for a fruitful discussion, interventions from the floor should be as brief as possible and not exceed two minutes. The speaking list will be closed when the maximum number of interventions has been reached and at the latest 30 minutes after the start of the session. So please remember to request your intervention within 30 minutes of the panel starting. Please be reminded that each intervention should be presented in a meaningful, orderly, and respectful manner, observing the time limit and focusing on recommendations related to the topic of the session. Zoom participants can also address their questions to the panelists via the chat function. Once again, welcome to this panel. And before we get started, we're going to watch a short video. I'll see you in a few minutes. Hi, my name is Carly Church and I'm a human trafficking crisis intervention counselor in Ontario, Canada. I am also a survivor of domestic sex trafficking. I was trafficked by two men here in Canada where they lured, groomed, and manipulated me into the sex trade. They took complete control over me while they learned everything about me. I call this a psychological hold. There was not much I wouldn't have done in order to get back into their good books. They had complete control over me and even though they weren't around all the time, I would have never left. I didn't get out until I was helped by an undercover police officer within a human trafficking unit. He did almost everything right from the moment he met me in that hotel room to the end of my entire court process. Immediately after he helped me exit from a hotel room, um, he took me to the police station where I did provide a statement. After that, court, after that statement was given, um, I then entered a whole um, different part of my life that I, I wasn't really prepared for. I always say that I have the trauma of being trafficked and I have the trauma of testifying in court. In Canada, what makes prosecution so difficult is the way that our law is written in the criminal code. It implies that there needs to be an element of fear um, without a reasonable doubt. This is incredibly difficult to prove as there's often little to no physical evidence in a trafficking investigation. It often becomes more of a he said, she said situation which puts significant pressure on the victim or survivor to testify perfectly while having to speak about some of their most traumatic experiences in their life. Defense lawyers often attempt to discredit someone and make them out to look like a bad person or in fact suggest that they actually wanted to be doing what they were doing as they didn't leave or ask for help. This can be significantly detrimental to one's mental health. In my situation, I had to testify for several days in front of my traffickers in a room filled with people who were complete strangers, where I had to relive some of the most traumatic experiences of my life while I watched videos and pictures displayed in the courtroom of myself. What would have significantly helped me would have, had the, would have been having the opportunity to speak to somebody with lived experience who had actually in fact went through the court process themselves, where I could sit down and ask what I might expect during this process, what could come up. Uh, I also would have um, definitely benefited from speaking to somebody about what, what I might face psychologically. I would have wanted to know the truth about how long, unpredictable, and difficult the court process can be. I always say that the truth will not break us. We have already been through the worst. What's going to break us is being blindsided. It's also really important to try and take some of the weight off of an individual who's testifying. 
Oftentimes it feels like the entire outcome of the court process relies on the victim or survivor's statement or testimony. Um, the detective that worked in my case did exactly that. He often tried to take some of that pressure um, of testifying off of me. So what he would always say to me is he would always tell me that no matter what, whether a guilty or a not guilty, this was still a win for him. He said that in the eight years of working in the human trafficking unit, that he had never seen somebody in the situation or the state that he had found me in to where I had come to at that point. So he said, no matter what happens, guilty or not guilty, this will still be a win for him. For that, I'll be ever, forever grateful for him. Because when I did get that phone call where I was told that my traffickers were not found guilty of human trafficking, it did not completely destroy me because all I could hear in the back of my mind was this is a still a win for us. My entire co court press process took nearly two years from start to finish. This held me back from moving forward and uh, moving forward in my life and healing. After everything, my traffickers were not found guilty of human trafficking and they were released on time served. My traffickers did serve almost two years and were found guilty of some charges. They were uh, lesser charges than human trafficking. Now, today, I get to do these things to support individuals. All the things I talked about that would have benefited me, I now get to implement in other individuals' lives as they move through that court process. Um, I'm embedded with the Human Trafficking Unit here in, in Durham Regional Police Services, where I, in fact, actually go out with the police. Um, so when the police go to hotel rooms, that individual has the opportunity to either speak to the police or the police can clear that hotel room and I can go in and they can speak to me in complete confidence. Anything they say to me, I cannot then relate to the police. We look, work from a very client-centered or victim-centered approach um, where there's no pressure to give a statement, that we will build that healthy relationship, we will ensure that we can meet every single basic need so that the individual can make an informed decision and have another option if they would like to leave and then they can choose whether they want to give a statement at some point in the future or if they just want to work with me on moving forward in their life. Since I've started working with the police and being embedded in that police unit, there's actually been a 94% increase of individuals wanting to make a report to police after building that healthy relationship and having their needs met. Um, this has been incredibly successful and it has actually given time to prepare people for the court process to build that relationship so that when things don't go as planned, which we all know often do in the justice system, um, they have that healthy support network to come back on. So today I've dedicated my life to advocating for change for survivors of human trafficking. I am hopeful that you are able to take something away from today that may help you better support victims and survivors in the future. Thank you. I would like to thank Ms. Church for sharing her personal and professional experiences with us and for reminding us of the importance of victim-centered approaches to prosecution. She reminds us that when support is insufficient, the court process can sometimes be as traumatic as a trafficking experience itself. And the numbers are striking. Her unit observed a 94% increase in police reports as a result of investing in building trust and meeting the victim's needs. Let us learn from this positive experience. Once again, this panel is dedicated to victim-centered approaches in prosecutions and investigations. As we know, the criminal justice process is important to hold offenders accountable, but it may not be the most important aspect of recovery for the victim. How do we conduct effective investigations and prosecutions while also supporting the victim and securing his or her rights? This panel will discuss the application of the victim-centered, drama-informed approach to investigation and prosecution. And I'm pleased that we have some outstanding panelists for this presentation. Our four panelists are Ms. Maya Rusikova, who is Executive Director of Stalit in the Russian Federation, Ms. Pam Bowen, who is Senior Policy Advisor at the Crown Prosecution Service of the United Kingdom, as well, Sister Gabriella Batani, Coordinator of Talitha Kum, and Mr. Wanchai Rajanavan, who is a Senior Consultant Prosecutor in Thailand. At this point, we will turn it over, excuse me, to Ms. Ruzakova, who will discuss the access to justice for victims of trafficking in persons and the role of rehabilitation services. 
Ms. Rusikova. Good afternoon, colleagues, friends. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to have this opportunity to speak today at this session. It's very, uh, it's a very important event, and it's a big event for all of us. It's something that will help to uh, shape our work as specialists, as, as professionals, and I'm very pleased that we have this chance to exchange views today. I think that the presentations that we have already, uh, the presentation that we heard, it set the tone. And I'd like to say a big thank you uh, for this, because we are going to talk precisely about access to justice. We're going to talk about uh, protecting the victims, and we're going to talk about how we can help them to uh, help them uh, get access to justice and make this whole process more effective and less traumatic for them. We all know the key principles on which we base our work. They are very well known. We all work with the Palermo Protocol. We all work with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. But unfortunately, often we forget that our victim, the victims we're dealing with here, these are people who are coming with a completely uh, with a different background. These are people who often, uh, not by coincidence, have become victims of crimes. People who throughout their lives have uh, never encountered a situation where people are respecting their rights and are fighting for their rights. So what's important for us? What's important? is just how much we focus our work on ensuring that the victims are aware of the whole process, are aware of all the action that's going to be taken. It's very important that any operation uh, that's uh, worked out between the NGOs, the police, the government uh, bodies, the uh, law enforcement bodies, All of this has to be uh, very much concentrated on the victim, centered on the victim. And often the organizations that are working together, uh, the different professionals, we understand each other. But the victim is, is uh, outside of all this and loses central focus. And this is very important to remember. So let's think about, let's reflect on who are these people who end up as victims of human trafficking. These are people who have often had very difficult life circumstances. We're talking about people who, for example, have uh, substance abuse problems. These could be people with the special needs. People who have debts, for example, people who are themselves in conflict with the law, who had problems with the law before they became human trafficking, or during their exploitation, they could have been forced, for example, to carry out illegal actions. Then we have people who uh, might have uh, mental health problems. And uh, unfortunately, very often the rehabilitation services, the rehabilitation centers, are not able to provide the full range of services, especially those centers which are located in, or the, the, the centers which are operated by the NGOs. Often they have very limited financial resources to work with. And so this is another very important issue for us. Also, the victims often have uh, difficult uh, relations with their families. They might not have colleagues, friends, uh, no one to turn to, no one to help them. And so it's important for us to understand that all of the participants in this process, they have to be aware of who they're working with. They have to be fully aware of the seriousness, the responsibility of uh, what we have to be aware of what a person who has, has gone through who is in this situation. And so it's uh, important that we not ignore the special needs, that there have to be the specialized services that can help people to address their substance abuse problems, for example, or their mental health issues. Uh, and lack of these services 
can lead to a situation where investigations do not end up going through to the prosecution stage and are not effective in the end. Another uh, particular responsibility here is uh, with children. Children uh, have a difficult time living in our adult world in general. We know very well that we know this well as parents. But children who've gone through exploitation and who have ended up with such serious trauma, it's not twice more difficult, it's ten times more difficult for them to work with us and to take part in all of these, uh, in all of this work. And so very important here is that we cannot consider children in the same way as we work with adults. We need to give children particular attention and we need to have specialized services for children adapted to their age needs. And most important, we have this tremendous responsibility that we need to ensure that they can continue their uh, life as a child. We have to return them to the kinds of uh, activities and past pastimes that fit their age and that meet their needs. And so here, protecting children during the whole legal process, this should be accompanied by specialists who are with the child, accompanying the child from the beginning to the end. It's very difficult for children to get used to constantly changing adults, to constantly be rebuilding relations. And so, as what we've, what we've heard from the victims, it's very important that there not be this repeat trauma for the person taking part in this process. This is not acceptable in the case of a child. There should be one interview, an interview conducted once, and we cannot have uh, we cannot have the child confronted with the traffickers, with the people who uh, exploited the child. And so we need to focus not just on training for the specialists who are working directly with the victims, our specialists at the rehabilitation centers know how to go about their work, but we need to work with the entire help providing system on a comprehensive basis so as to ensure that we are not having this kind of repeat repeat trauma and this is crucial for the effectiveness of the investigations, the effectiveness of carrying out all of the legal procedures and how effectively we can uh, prove the guilt of the perpetrators. This is very important. It's important to get this across to the police, to the prosecutors, the courts, everybody who's taking part in the proceedings. The, act, the focus has to be on the victims. And this is what makes our work more effective and makes it possible to uh, reinforce the work of the police also having uh, th there's a huge number of little details that enable us to be able to help the victim feel more uh, at ease and produce a better result. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Maya. Thank you very much, Maya. I really appreciate it. Um, um, we'll now, we'll now go, go to our, our second, second panelist. panelist. Who is sister, sister Gabriella Batani, once again coordinator of the Cocoon. Cocoon. Sister Batani will share her vision and analysis, and analysis of the gaps, gaps between the criminal, criminal justice system and the system. system. Thank you, Thank sister. You, sister. So today, Talita Kun counts 55 active groups involving 2,600 sisters and collaborators who last year supported 15,500 survivors. My reflection today are based on their accounts and reports. We sister met victims in various contexts of vulnerability, such as women and children exploited in the sex market, undocumented migrants, asylum seekers, people in detention, street children. We try to establish a trustful relationship, providing not only urgent assistance, but also responding to their spiritual needs. We host them as our most welcome guests, as sisters and brothers. When we sister met victims, we normally do not ask many questions. We know that we have to listen to the story many, many times before the person is able to share the true story. 
trust must be stronger than fear, stronger than threats, than shame. The person must be able to tell the raw, violent truth and to be able to bear its psychological burden. We listen to the pain, the broken dreams, the violence, and we also share the hopes, the resilience and courage that grow slowly. Yet in many instances, when these stories are reported to the police, somehow they seem never to be enough. It seems that it is not sufficient to show the scars, describe places, give names, and sometimes to clearly cut in an exploitative situation. It may sound, sound like a paradox, but to be recognized as a victim is hard work. When we deal with the bureaucratic legal procedures, we are usually confronted with the main stumbling block of proving that the trafficked person are not guilty of other crimes, such as the violation of immigration laws, labor laws, family laws, or other criminal code provisions. They must also prove that as trafficked person, they did not consent to their exploitation, which can be challenging at times. I remember my first case, a group of women had been detained because of drug dealing. During several visits to the prison, one of the sisters became aware that these women had been trapped in situation of abuse of power, violence and exploitation. After studying the case, we brought it to the attention of the criminal justice authority, who after the necessary investigation, recognized the women as victim of trafficking. These women needed to be looked at with different eyes, eyes able to go, to go beyond the surface. The same situation occurs very often, particularly when the exploitation is the result of widely accepted practices due to structural, culturally based asymmetrical relationship between employee and employer, woman and man, adult and child, national and foreigner, rich and poor. Yet even when victims are recognized as such, their situation can still be difficult. I think about those who are in need of prolonged assistance because of the mental health consequences of being trafficked. I also think about the situation of foreigner born trafficked person, the recognition of their right to stay in the host country is linked to the recognition of their legal status of, as victim. The two legal procedures often do not unfold in a coordinated way, which may result in further victimization. The result is that trafficked person often fall outside the safety net of criminal justice systems. These victims are those who cannot benefit from the assistance provided by government and civil societies organization. We sisters try to be on the side of each person, regardless of religious faith, life choices, political beliefs, legal status. This approach make us a borderline marginal group. We do our best to offer care and assistance, to promote education and work, to comply in compliance with the laws of the countries where we live and die. Our experience confirmed that the victim-centered trauma-enforced approach to investigating and prosecuting trafficking is essential to ensure that victims enjoy protection, support services to heal the trauma and an adequate compensation for the suffered damages. But it is not enough to achieve justice. Investigation and prosecution need to identify and hold the world trafficking chain responsible for the crime. Those who recruit, who exploit, who earn from the exploitation, who corrupt and are corrupted. Trafficking is an extremely lucrative business where too many interests intertwine. Victims too often bear the full burden. I am increasingly convinced that we need to adopt a complex approach to address effectively a complex crime such as human trafficking. We live in a difficult time. As a global network, Talita Kum acts in a social and legal environment that is more and more hostile towards some social groups. It is increasingly difficult to reach out to victims who are in administrative detention 
as undocumented migrants out of the justice system's reach. It is increasingly difficult to assist individuals who are trapped in houses as domestic and sexual slaves, or to warn individuals of accepting trafficker promises in communities plagued by violence, corruption, lack of opportunity and safety. The increasing marginalization of migrants, religious and national minorities, women and girls, provides fertile grounds for trafficking to flourish. And the present pandemic has further exacerbated that situation. Trafficking is not only a heinous crime against an individual, it is both the result of the cause of deep wounds in the social and economic fabric of all communities and countries. As Talita Kum, we are engaged in healing those wounds, trying not only to bring justice for trafficked person, but to promote a more just way of living together. It is a difficult pathway. We walk every day together with the survivors. Thank you. Thank you very much, sister. We will now turn to Wanchai Ruchanavan. And based on his extensive working with victims of labor trafficking, he will share with us the challenges of working with the victims from the prosecution side and the key differences with other forms of trafficking. And I will now turn it over to Mr. Rujanavon. Wanchai, can you please make sure that you're not on mute? We cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, today I will share with you one of the most uh, high profile cases of human trafficking in Thailand. Uh, this is uh, uh, a case of Rohingya, which is very difficult to work with the victims because they are uh, very vulnerable and they don't know the language. We have to use interpreter all the time. And at the same time, they are tortured all the way. So we have to help them and uh, work with them very much in order to uh, make them uh, uh, cooperate with us to be witness. Uh, during 2013 to, to 2015, Rohingya victims were systematically trafficked by sea from Bangladesh and Myanmar through Thailand uh, to Malaysia and Indonesia, and from Malaysia and Indonesia to uh, the Middle East. And next slide, please. Uh, each victim had to pay 2,000 US dollar to organize criminal group, with some traveling based on the promise that the relative would pay the money later. So some paid already, some are not yet paid. Those who had not paid prior to the journey were detained dead and forced to contract, to contact the relative to send money. If no money was received, the victim were tortured and so to be uh, uh, slept, uh, labor slept in to Malaysia or in Indonesia. And then you will see uh, the route. Next slide, please. That they, uh, we have recruiter, a broker in Bangladesh and in Myanmar, and then the transporter are in Thailand, and the receiver uh, were in Malaysia and Indonesia. The trafficking and smuggling of Rohingya victims were conducted by organized criminal group involving broker, transporter, receiver, and abuser, as you have said, as, uh, as you have seen. The victim is had a color rope tied in the wrist to identify the broker. This only for the purpose of sharing the profit. So they know who was sent by whom and uh, share the money together. Next slide, please. You see the, uh, next please. You see, this is the situation uh, uh, in a fishing boat. They were very crowded. Sometimes more than 500 were put in one single boat and they have to travel to the sea for weeks. And then, next speed. In 2015, the Thai police read 
three camps, rescuing 80 Rohingya victims from Bangladesh and Myanmar, arresting a few offenders with confiscating their mobile phone. We found 26 graves were found near the camp or were exhumed it for identification. The victim were identified and sent to government shelter for protection and for assistance. In the shelter, we have a social worker and psychiatrist work with them, including medical doctor. However, all of these have to work with the, the victim through interpreter. Victim were encouraged to provide as much information as possible and to serve as witnesses. We need to make them confident that without the assistance, the, uh, the perpetrator will go, would go free and would not and would be punished. In not only work with the victim, the po police use special investigation technique to locate additional culprit and arrange for victim to identify the offender. The name of suspect traffickers were checked with victims and the name of suspect they sent to the anti-money laundering office to identify suspicious financial transaction and the link between uh, money transfer. Information was also passed on to Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Malaysia for the, for, for the cooperation. In the end, uh, we have a success case because we can charge 155 offenders, including 11 local politicians, four police officers, and six military officers, of which 105 three offenders were arrested, the, the other uh, on the run. Due to the influence of one offender, the case was uh, transferred to Bangkok criminal uh, under the witness protection program. Uh, nearly all of the victims were willing to testify and uh, all were allowed to remain in Thailand with legal visa and work permit together with other uh, benefit. Uh, they have to go to they had to go through the court process. They have to testify with 70 defense lawyers to court examine them. In the end, 62 offenders were convicted of being or involved with organized criminal group, smuggling of migrants and trafficking in person. 33 offenders received the maximum penalty of 50 years imprisonment. The other 29 convict offenders received penalty ranging from 11 and a half to 37, 37 year imprisonment. In this case, we had destroyed all the ring, all the trafficking ring uh, of uh, a trafficking of Rohingya by sea. But then again, without the cooperation from the victim it, to testify in court, we will not be able to convict anyone. And that's why we have to work very much. We have to pay attention to the victim. We have to work with them. We have to try to anchor it. We have to give all the assistance need. Everything that we can work with them, we will do. And this is without the cooperation from the victims, we will not have a success case like this. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Wan Chai. We, we appreciate your presentation. Our next speaker is Pam Bowen, and she will share with us her insights on how to work better for and with victims. Pam, over to you. So my presentation builds on and also follows on from some of the important key messages um, given in, by the excellent speakers in the, um, in the last panel. Um, so some of the challenges that we face in prosecuting these abhorrent crimes, understandably, um, are the primary difficulties concerning victims. So that's their identification, reporting and providing testimony. So for many extremely vulnerable children and adults who have already suffered long periods of exploitation, they are then expected to provide compelling testimony to successfully prosecute their traffickers. Um, also in the UK, we've seen a move to recruitment and exploitation of victims now through digital devices, which provides us with challenges, but also opportunities through an independent evidence trail. In the UK, we've also seen a surge in trafficking for criminal exploitation, largely again through digital devices, where it's unlikely that victims would ever support criminal proceedings. So these then are some of the challenges um, that we face. 
Um, so about 18 months ago, we conducted a deep dive exercise into one year's worth of cases um, referred to prosecutors by um, police. Um, to establish the reasons why cases were either successful or uh, unsuccessful to inform best practice. And these were some of the findings which specifically relate to victim and witness issues. So um, largely investigations rely too heavily on the evidence of the victim rather than the motivations of the defendant. Victims often need significant sustained support, and where there is a lack of sus sustained support, victims then often return to their traffickers. A proactive or evidence-led investigation, where the intelligence picture and evidence is built up before disruption, is often the best approach, with no reliance on victims reporting, Thanks, reporting them, um, and no victims even identified. Um, investigation and prosecution can take up to three years plus, um, during which time victims no longer want to support criminal proceedings um, because of delays, or they may have moved on with their lives or returned to their home countries. So um, these were some of the strategies that we developed with law enforcement to address the challenges. First of all, um, cases need to be referred to prosecutors who've got experience and expertise in dealing with these complex cases. And those prosecutors are involved in the very early stages of an investigation to provide ongoing advice on evidence needed um, in lines of inquiry and early liaison with authorities overseas. Now this differs from the way in which we normally work in the UK, which is we have an independent prosecution service that will usually only become involved after the police have investigated cases. So in cases of modern slavery and trafficking, the police and prosecutors work closely in building robust cases and gathering evidence without the victim. Um, often in these cases, a crime will be identified through such sources as um, sort of forms of intelligence or through the Schengen information system. Um, there is far greater reliance on technology to investigate these cases, but also to prosecute. Um, maybe a next step here might be the use of artificial intelligence, particularly in sifting through significant volumes of digital material. So in this way, we can bring victimless prosecutions um, using covert surveillance techniques to collect evidence. And that includes through cell site analysis, um, call data, downloads from phones and devices, flight manifests, banking evidence, and police undercover evidence. But financial investigation is absolutely vital. And I know that this was also re-emphasized in um, sort of the previous panel. It proves motive and the deliberate exploitation of victims for gain. We can also consider use of expert evidence. Um, we've also done quite a lot of work with um, adult services websites um, to obtain intelligence and evidence from them. So law enforcement use data wash tools to identify potential victims and the websites provide the police with details of those who are putting up profiles of sex workers, um, the email addresses and contact details and credit card details, which helps the police then collect evidence which links them back to the, um, the traffickers. But we also have to consider from the outset of an investigation how the case will be presented at court for the jury without hearing any evidence from victims. So we need impactful and often visual evidence to do that. So some of the benefits of bringing these sort of prosecutions is where there is independent evidence which we can, where we can prove all of the elements of an offence. Um, we are able to bring evidence-led prosecutions where no victims are identified. Where victims have been identified, it removes the need on, from them to rely on their testimony. But even where they are willing to give testimony, it often reduces the full burden on them of proving the case. It enables um, prosecution where victims are fearful of reporting or supporting prosecution, and traffickers would otherwise not be criminalized for any offenses. It allows victims to move on with their lives without having to go through the trauma of recalling their experiences in court. And there's a greater reliance on the motive of traffickers and the financial investigation, which leads to greater opportunities to identify and confiscate assets. But these are some of the drawbacks, and particularly compensation 
So whilst it's possible to award compensation to victims in these cases, it can be more difficult if they've moved on and the authorities have lost contact with them. Where no victims at all are identified, the court is unable to award compensation or make a reparation order. Sentencing too can often uh, result in more lenient sentences. Where victims do provide testimony, um, often other offences are disclosed, such as threats of violence, sexual assaults, theft of their ID documents, false imprisonment or assaults. The judge can also see firsthand victim vulnerabilities, um, but also receive victim impact statements, which will highlight the physical and psychological trauma the offences have had on them. It also doesn't reduce the length of time um, that it takes to, from investigation to finalisation. They're resource intensive and material from digital devices can be significant, sometimes in multi languages, which have to be translated and reviewed. And unless this evidence has been obtained proactively, it's very rare for a prosecution to go ahead, even if the witness subsequently withdraws. But we believe that the benefits here far outweigh the drawbacks. In circumstances where traffickers wouldn't ordinarily be prosecuted, victims are not re-traumatized as they don't have to provide evidence. Perpetrators continue to receive significant prison sentences, deportation where appropriate, and have their assets confiscated. And so finally, the case types of cases where this is most effective are cases of trafficking for sexual exploitation, where profiles of the victims um, are placed on adult services websites. And uh, we have a significant problem of cases of trafficking children for criminal exploitation, where children are trafficked using drugs, drugs lines on digital devices, and accordingly were able to prove their movement and uh, recruitment without um, actually using the victims themselves. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Pam, for that great presentation. We are now going to move to floor interventions. I'd like to remind those who are going to speak, to please, please limit your comments to two minutes because we want to get to everyone. First off, uh, we will hear from the Holy See delegation and the EU delegation is on deck. Over to the Holy See delegation. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Although it is indispensable that victims are at the center of the criminal justice process, attention to the victims must not be limited to seeking justice alone. Rather, there must be a guarantee for their human rights. Victim safety should be, of course, guaranteed through the process, and they should be allowed to present evidence, both in the initial investigation and in the trial proceedings, while receiving the necessary support. If they do not feel able to testify in person, they should be provided other means to give witness. For example, pre-recorded interviews could be played in court or their testimony could be heard from NGOs or international organizations acting as an amicus curia. The result of justice should be for the victim a sense of release and ransom from their slavery. Victims should be able to recognize that, once again, they have the, the possibility of a dignified life as a bearer of inalienable rights. They should also receive some form of adequate compensation for their suffering they experienced, as well as the opportunity to look ahead with hope towards the future. In addition, they should have the opportunity to fully integrate into the society where they find themselves or reintegrate in their country of origin. On this particular issue, the addendum to the OSC plan to combat trafficking in human beings one decade later leaves no room for doubt. It stresses the need to ensure the necessary assistance is provided in the process of safe return and through cooperation where possible in the integration of former victims of trafficking by the authorities, social services, or NGOs as appropriate of their country of origin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. The EU delegation is next. Canada delegation is on deck. Thank you very much. We would like to thank all the presenters for their interventions. 
we very much welcome that this extremely important topic um, is the subject of one of today's panels. The EU promotes a comprehensive approach when addressing trafficking in human beings, which is human rights based, victim centered, gender sensitive and age specific. Victim rights must remain at the center of our efforts. Already in Brussels ministerial council decision, uh, the OSC participating states underlined the importance of providing effective access to justice for victims of trafficking, including in areas of counseling and information about their legal rights in a language they, they can understand, as well as in providing the possibility to obtain compensation for the damage suffered. In June, the EU Commission adopted a victim rights strategy, recalling that victims of trafficking in human beings are particularly vulnerable group, and that trafficking is of, often also violence against women and girls. The main objective of the EU strategy on victims' rights is to ensure that all victims of crime, no matter where in the EU or what circumstance the crime took place, can fully rely on their rights. This strategy is based on a two-strand approach that focuses on empowering victims of crime and working together with victims uh, for victims' rights. We also agree with today's speakers that outline that adopting a victim-centered approach also entails to do our utmost to minimize the negative impact of criminal procedures on the victims and avoid re-traumatization. We would like to insist on the importance of, of addressing a gender dimension of human trafficking. In March, the European Commission adopted a new gender equality strategy, recalling that women and girls form the vast majority of victims of trafficking. A gender sensitive approach is therefore crucial to help better protecting the victims. A disproportionate part of which are women and girls, but also to increase the efficiency of the criminal response in this respect, we would very much appreciate if any of the speakers could elaborate on how this gender dimension is taken into account in their work and on the impact that gender sensitivity can have on investigation and prosecution. Finally, since we are discussing today the adoption of victim-centered approach to combating trafficking in human beings, we would like to mention the currently ongoing Blue Heart campaign of the UNODC. This global awareness raising initiative seeks to encourage involvement of government from governments, civil society, the corporate sector and individuals. Several EU member states support the UN Voluntary Trust Fund for Victims of Trafficking in Persons, which provides vital assistance and protection to victims of trafficking through specialized organizations across the globe. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. The Canada delegation is next to be followed by the Russian Federation Ministry of the Interior. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Modérateur. Uh, puisque je n'ai pas pu terminer mon intervention au précédent panel, j'aimerais finish my If anybody at this conference would like to know more about our project for PPP to counter organized crime, then um, I would ask you to give them information so they can contact me. And with regard to this panel, I'd like to thank Ms. Judy for her courage, her contribution today, and her active role in helping to counter organized crime in her community in Ontario and Canada. Now, in her very hitting, uh, hard hitting and relevant uh, introduction, Ms. Rich spoke about the importance of victim centered approaches when it comes to investigations. Once again, we need to share information uh, and we are prepared to do that in terms of our partnerships if you would like to Now, Canada tries to put victims in the foreground when it comes to all of our efforts to combat this form of crime. And that's why our new national strategy to fight THV focuses on prevention and partnership. And we have an additional pillar which we'd like to add, which is empowerment and empowerment of victims and survivors. This pillar underscores the essential role that victims and survivors need to play when it comes to shedding light on government policy and how it needs to develop to counter these crimes. And it underscores the vital importance of offering support to victims and survivors so that 
they can reclaim control over their lives and their independence. And currently, we are working on a consulting committee made up of survivors, and this committee should use a victim-centered approach so that we can increase the credibility of victims and reduce the need for them to testify in court so that we can minimize the sort of re-traumatization that Ms. Church talked about. Now, they know the trauma uh, and talking to somebody else who understands this can help to uh, he help them to heal. We've already spoken at the last uh, panel about the forms of evidence that can be used to bolster victim testimony. For example, we can find information from financial records such as the buses that they've taken or online transactions. This can all help to support the investigation while minimizing... Please conclude. Nous recommandons que tous mettent en Thank you very much. The uh, Russian Federation Ministry of the Interior is next to be followed by the Executive Committee of the Commonwealth of Independent States. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Moderator. Sir Valiant Ritchie, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to first of all express our thanks for the possibility to take part in this important international event and we would like to thank all of the OSCE uh, people who in this difficult time and during the pandemic have made such a big contribution to uh, coordinating our efforts, bringing us together to uh, continue these efforts to combat human trafficking, which is one of the most uh, dangerous uh, crimes in the 21st century. I'd like to look briefly here and uh, I'd like to ask the, organization, the organizers to, uh, to, I'd like to share a few thoughts here about uh, Russia's work in this area. We work on a comprehensive basis, working with the different uh, parts of the legal system and the law enforcement agencies, each working within their powers. NGOs are also involved, they play an important role. They provide us with uh, help, they provide us uh, with victims also for the victims of slavery and this helps to also uh, improve the situation in the Russian Federation. The um, main actors in, uh, work in the prevention work here include the Interior Ministry and uh, under the Minister Mr. Kolokosov who plays the coordinating role to, uh, for all the different bodies within the state system to carry out the prevention work and also uh, providing help with legislative initiatives. Every year, we see of, of between 20 and 30 human trafficking crimes. In 2019, we had 22 such crimes and uh, 24, 24 cases of, of, of uh, forced labor. And what we also see is that part of these crimes are moving online and also uh, sexual exploitation crimes. Uh, uh, in all of this, we see this movement online. The, we have from, we also saw up to 90% of uh, crimes in this area using ICTs. This reflects the global trend in general, where in, around the world we see that these dangerous types of crimes are moving more and more online. This is a natural, development and this requires a comprehensive approach from the law enforcement bodies we'd be uh, grateful thank you no, yeah, I just, I would just like by way of a conclusion to say that the experience that we have built up in, with, 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 in our work also with the OCE, it's an essential condition for us to be able to uh, continue these efforts to combat these crimes thank you Thank you very much. We will now hear from the Executive Committee of the Commonwealth of Independent States to be followed by Mr. Sean Wheeler of Starfish Ministries. 
Уважаемые участники конференции, позвольте поблагодарить. In concert to counter THB, on the basis of universal and regional agreements and treaties, we've drawn up a coordination mechanism. And in almost all CIS countries, we have legislation which is in harmony and transposes these international treaties, as well as the UN Convention Against Organized Crime. A fundamental document of the CIS in this area is the agreement on cooperation between CIS countries in combating trafficking in human beings as well as human organs and tissues. And this includes the uh, specific crime of organ and tissue trafficking, including in the CIS. Now, it should be noted that this is an issue which we pay a great deal of attention to in the CIS. And you can see that in a decision of heads of state of the CIS, the concept for cooperation between the uh, CIS is encountering THB. When it comes to measures that we're currently taking in the area of countering human trafficking, we have the 2019 to 2023 program and the implementation of this is at agency level uh, between the various law enforcement agencies, they have to then make use of the CIS committee, which uh, provides coordination support so that they can share experience and work together, which helps to improve the effectiveness of our efforts to combat trafficking in humans and illegal or unlawful migration. Those who've signed up to that agreement in 2018 and 2019 managed to uncover over 400 such crimes. Here I mean those relating to trafficking in human beings and human tissues and organs. And 438 people were brought to justice for such crimes. Uh, some of these were related to the crime of trafficking in organs and tissues. That's two individuals. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. We will now hear from Sean Wheeler from Starfish Ministries to be followed by the Russian Federation delegation. Yes, good morning. Um, well, or afternoon or evening, wherever you're at. I really just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's participating in this conference. Um, as a survivor, uh, that, that is the expertise that I bring to the table. Um, it, it, essentially my experience, I'm not, I'm not a trained psychologist, I'm not an academic, and I'm not trained in law enforcement, but um, you are making a difference. And I wanted everyone to know how much I appreciate that because I feel like I have a voice and that my voice has been heard. And I would also say that, you know, in the United States, a very good study done by ECPAT, um, which is an organization that I believe is a global organization. Here in the United States, they have dis, uh, discovered that um, half the victims in trafficking are boys, um, which is typically not recognized. And in fact, according to the ECBAT study, more boys are actually used in child pornography, um, which is sadly a huge production in the United States um, as well. And my biggest challenge is trying to get Americans to understand that uh, child trafficking happens here and we need in the United States to address that. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say. I just thank you all for your work. Um, you really encouraged me and that's it. Thank you, Sean. We will now hear from the Russian Federation delegation and the International Justice Mission is on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. I would like to just say a few words about uh, what my colleague from ECPAT said. 
an important activity of the law enforcement work is to protect the rights of uh, legal migrants in Russia. It's the migrants who are at greatest risk among population groups of ending up the victims of human trafficking. Now, practice shows that uh, this is a way to control their behavior, especially if they are illegally in the host country. The most vulnerable category here are minors, the children of labor migrants who often face difficulties in their integration. Now, this is a priority for the Russian Federation. And here we saw how problems in this kind of area have led to unrest in some EU countries. Problems with the situation uh, of migrants ends up can create ghettos, can create uh, conditions for crime to flourish. And a lack of knowledge about the culture, uh, more knowledge about the culture, more knowledge about how to communicate can help us to ensure that these people do not end up uh, tangled up in exploitation. And so this is something that we also need to remember this is something that needs to be a part of the law enforcement agency's work and so in this context an important area of work for law enforcement is to ensure that uh, migrants rights are respected right to labor right to decent living conditions right to medical aid and ensure that the uh, labor and migration laws are being respected. All of these measures should work to uh, prevent illegal migration and to ensure the rights and the interests of migrants, no matter what their situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from the International Justice Mission to be followed by the Euro European Institute for Crime Prevention and Control. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. At International Justice Mission, our experienced counter-trafficking investigators, lawyers, and social workers work with prosecutors, police, and judges in 15 countries to build their capacity and ensure that they are equipped to be victim-centered. Our expert staff deliver trauma-informed skill training, and as noted yesterday, this often requires unlearning. These competencies are then embedded by mentoring police and prosecutors through live trafficking cases. We also provide victim services and walk with survivors through the criminal justice process while equipping government partners to build the survivor services that they need. I think as we all know, psychosocial support and victim-centered processes ensure better engagement and better outcomes. Firstly, better outcomes for survivors who have their rights upheld are protected from re-traumatization and are empowered to fully share their testimony and better outcomes for prosecutors by securing the evidence we need for convictions. Our recommendation is that we must ensure the continuity and coordination of victim-centered responses across all jurisdictions so that trafficking survivors get the support they need both in destination countries and at home. This is where NGOs, faith communities, and civil society organizations experienced in anti-trafficking work are perfectly placed to work in partnership with law enforcement by not just providing care to survivors, but skills training on victim-centered processes. We have seen that when we work together, we can protect survivors throughout their engagement with the justice system, and we can increase convictions to provide them with the justice they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from the European Institute for Crime Prevention and Control, followed by Ms. Courtney Skye. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to start by thanking Mr. Ritchie and the organization, as well as the panelists. It's been, it's been a very interesting afternoon, and I'm delighted to hear about the important work different actors do to end the impunity of traffickers and to safeguard victims' rights. Um, I would like to briefly introduce our new publication, which is called Uncovering Labor Trafficking, Investigation Tool for Law Enforcement and Checklist for Labor Inspectors. It's a very practical tool that helps the police and other authorities identify cases of labor trafficking and plan and start the investigations. 
The tool has been created as a part of an EU-funded flow project together with partner countries Estonia, Latvia and Bulgaria. Finnish police officers and labor inspectors also took part to offer their expertise and to ensure the relevance of the investigation tool to its target user groups. Uh, in line with the topic of the panel today, the tool highlights the need for victim-centered investigations and for more resources and specialization in tackling human trafficking. Well-planned interventions break the, uh, break the offender's control over the victim and help establish the victim's trust in the authorities. The victim's safety and well-being must remain as a priority concern throughout the whole uh, criminal justice process. In addition, as many of the plan panelists stated, uh, cooperation between different authorities, both nationally and internationally, is important as information sharing and well-established practices lead to more effective investigations. You can find the publication on the virtual presentation table in the conference dropbox and on the heuni.fi website. It's been very well received and we're happy with the result. Please feel free to share it with anyone you think might be interested in it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We will now hear from Ms. Courtney Sky to be followed by the Center for Legal Research and Development in Nepal. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Courtney Sky. I'm a researcher at the Yellowhead Institute and a member of the Mohawk Nation, a people indigenous to Canada and the US. Uh, today, I'm here to call attention to work being undertaken within Canada and the ongoing failure of the federal government to implement the findings of a national inquiry on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in Canada. This work began formally in 2016 and the final report was released over a year ago in June 2019. This inquiry was undertaken to independently discover the root causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls in Canada, including sexual exploitation and human trafficking. Over 2,300 families, survivors and experts contributed to this inquiry and there are currently thousands of Indigenous women and girls who have gone missing or been murdered in Canada. Among the increased top findings were that um, Among the increased top findings, Canada does not fully implement or comply with relevant right instruments, including the ICCPR, the ICESCR, CEDA, ICERD, UNDRIP, the Third Protocol to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the American Convention on Human Rights, and the Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Punishment, and Eradication of Violence Against Women. Uh, Canada has also failed to develop and implement a national action plan on ending violence that would provide the necessary oversight and implementation of the 231 calls for justice made by the inquiry. I'm here today to bring the OSCE's, OSCE's attention to the calls for justice of the national inquiry and to ensure that Canada implements these calls for justice, especially as they relate to addressing the disproportionate victimization of Indigenous women and girls to trafficking and exploitation through victim centers approaches. Indigenous women and girls in Canada are made vulnerable by Canada's continued inaction to address the disproportionate systemic violence we experience. I want to thank the members and the OSCE for your time and attention. Thank you very much. And our last intervention is from the Center for Legal Research and Development in Nepal. Hello, everyone. I'm Santos Marzan from uh, Center for Legal Research and Resource Development, uh, located in Nepal. Nepal is a South Asian country, uh, and it is also recognized as uh, uh, as a uh, in in context of human trafficking as a country of origin, transit, and destination. Nepal has recently ratified Palermo Protocol, and uh, we, we do specific uh, laws on human trafficking, and we are recently practicing human-centric approach and victim-centric approach in uh, criminal justice system as well. Uh, uh, Attending this uh, session, the yes, conference, I really re realized that most of the things are so common in even in Europe and in Nepal regarding the human trafficking. Though how the way a perpetrator uh, lower the victim or the suffering of the victim or challenges the victims are facing. Uh, 
in uh, particularly I, I would be happy if uh, someone uh, from the, the panel ex uh, elaborate about the victim impact report how it is developed or how we can uh, present because as a victims lawyers now in nepal we can develop we can prepare victim impact report to submit in the court but we are right now very confused how we gonna go how we gonna do these things thank you thank you very much uh we have some time left here for questions and so i'd like to direct a few questions to our our four great panelists today and my first question is this, what are the challenges associated with dealing with victims of labor trafficking and what can states do to better assist those victims? Credo che um, una delle difficoltà maggiori che ci troviamo one of the main problems that we face when working with victims who are used for for labor are the gray areas where it's not always easy from the outset to identify who the victims are and where the victims often do not see themselves as victims and that's where prevention comes in there needs to be a great deal of sensibility creando delle relazioni di fiducia e a partire da queste eh, identificare e tentare poi di lavorare insieme con gruppi di riflessione multidisciplinari nel rispetto delle diversità culturali perché spesso lavoriamo in contesti con persone cultural diversity of these groups often we're working with people from extremely so that we can try to find a collective solution. I think that's very important. Any other panelists wish to address that question? Okay. Another question for our panelists is, from your experience, what are the main challenges of victimless prosecutions and what strategies can be employed to overcome those barriers? I'm going to uh, continue sort of in terms of bringing prosecutions. Um, whilst I agree entirely with everything that the previous speaker, Sister Gabriella, has said, that victims often don't actually see themselves as victims. Um, but in terms of um, investigating cases, um, I think it's important um, to have an evidence-led um, investigation and prosecution where the police deploy covert surveillance, CCTV, in the areas where they're working, but also in the areas where they're living. Um, it's also important, I think, to, to have a financial investigation um, so that evidence can be collected about um, where wages are being paid to and um, you know sort of where they're where they're not being paid to the the actual um, victims themselves um, I think it's also important to um, cr contrast the lives of the exploiters um, with the lives of those actually being exploited so that um, courts can see the distinct um, differences and re re reaffirms the um, that, that they are living off the exploitation of, of the victims. Um, in terms of actually helping and supporting victims, where there are a large number, um, we have found it really advantageous to have advanced planning where, where we set up reception centers um, to support victims when they are recovered. Um, so that there will be a triage of the victim um, to look at their medical needs, whether they need an interpreter, whether they need clothing and nutrition. Um, and in those sort of situations, victims then are more inclined to um, support and help um, sort of an investigation and um, sort of to give, give evidence against the perpetrators. Thanks, Pam. Again, for our panelists, what do you think can be done to enhance the relationship between national referral mechanisms and criminal justice processes? I think that uh, uh, for, for labor exploitation, I think that the inspector, labor inspector is very important. 
because they have the, the, the they have the duty to uh, and authority to go into every factory. And then another one is working with NGO. Uh, we raise awareness. We give information. We give. Uh, we put hotline in in uh, wherever we have a, a what you call a very easy for labor exploitation, so that they can call and uh, our labor inspector will train that to to see what kind of uh, a suspect to be a labor exploitation, and then they will investigate it, and then refer to the. Uh, police and uh, investigator, so, and also NGO. Uh, we receive a lot of cases from NGO and hotline as well, and that they re refer to uh, a criminal justice, and then after that, it, it they can be arrested and prosecuted. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Wan Chai. Would any of other any of our panelists like to address that question before I move on to the next one? Um, I'm going to say in the United Kingdom, we have recognition of the role and the weight of an NRM decision in the criminal justice system um, and about sort of victim status. Um, and, and a lot of that is through um, a number of appeals and case law, which directly links the NRM decision making to um, the fact that somebody is a victim. Um, I think this is especially important um, in cases where there is um, somebody has been exploited, criminal, has been involved in criminal exploitation, and they themselves may be um, investigated and prosecuted. And the role of the NRM decision in establishing their status as a victim of trafficking um, can assist in the criminal justice process in um, identifying them and accordingly um, sort of enable them to raise non-punishment principles. Thank you, Pam. Um, and Pam, maybe you wanna address the next question along with our other panelists. What do you feel is missing to turn commitments on supporting victims and developing methods of victimless prosecution into concrete action? Um, I believe that it's important to ensure that there is support available in the long term, not just the short term, especially in more complex situations. People need to have support for a longer period of time during the entire case and after a trial when it comes back to social reintegration. I think that one of the other very important aspects is that access to justice needs to be guaranteed. Often we have a situation where within the legal system itself there is discrimination. Various priorities might be set who is more important? Who is the head poncho? Is more or less money involved? And that's where uh, more qualified or less qualified lawyers might be made use of and the victims can be abandoned and left to their own devices. So from the very beginning to the end, we need to ensure there is competent support available for the victims, not just legal support, but also psychosocial support. People need to feel that they will not be left alone. Obligation discussing their intervention, uh, the issue of bringing gender perspectives into your work with victims. Can any of our panelists elaborate on how you would incorporate gender perspectives into your work with victims? You mean gender perspective, right? Correct. I think that uh, one thing is we, uh, all the law enforcement and whoever involved in that, uh, especially the very important person like social worker and psychiatrist who work with the victims, must realize that all the victims are very important. And, uh, but not all of the victims need the same thing. I mean, for women and children, victims, they need special needs. They have special needs. So, so all of these have to, take, have to be taken care of. 
in order to uh, to take care of them in according to their status. And many of the victims are not as vulnerable as the, the others. Some are more vulnerable than others. For example, sexual exploitation, a uh, victim of, of, of sexual trafficking are more vulnerable uh, to, uh, I mean, for confidential, for confidentiality more than the uh, labor exploitation. So all this, we have to take an into consideration, including gender differences uh, between male and female, and especially children need a special care. Thank you. Credo sia molto Please go ahead. Credo sia molto importante uh, riconoscere la think that it is very important to take account of uh, the particular needs of each individual human. That's very important to us. We must acknowledge that each individual is unique in dignity. And when we're talking about trafficking in human beings, we cannot forget that more of uh, than 70% of the victims are women and children. And that is why both in legal terms and when looking at prevention and cultural transformation, we need to address the root causes which lead to the situation where women and children are especially vulnerable and that these vulnerabilities can be exploited. That is very important when fighting trafficking in persons. And it is only in this way that we can address this when we look at particular needs. Uh, we need to pay attention to the differences between men and women. Thank you very much. Ask each of our four panelists if you could make one recommendation for the attendees of this panel to take away from everything that you said. What would be that one recommendation? If our panelists could all make one recommendation that they would want the attendees of this panel to take away with them, what would that recommendation be? So, Pam, we'll start with you. Um, I think a victim-centered approach um, in w w whatever the circumstances, so whether a case is being investigated, prosecuted, or indeed whether um, victims are just being recovered, um, the need to take a victim-centered approach in um, the victim's needs, um, their rights, human rights, um, in investigations and prosecutions, um, to do as much as you can to relieve the burden from them in actually um, proving their case. Um, it's important, um, as I've already referred earlier, to ensure there is, there is financial investigation um, so that victim compensation and reparation can be considered in every case. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we'll turn it over to Wan Chai. Wan Chai, if there was yes, one recommendation you that, could uh, make. Uh, Victim is the center of every of the issue. Without the victims, nothing can be done. So, uh, but having said that, it doesn't mean that we we can expect that all the victims to cooperate and testify uh, in court. No matter whether they will cooperate or not, we have to give them assistance. We have to take care of them. But then again, after that, if we can persuade them to cooperate and testify, it's good. If not, it is their right. Because they have to think a lot of things in their mind. They are very, uh, uh, they've been tortured, they've been suffered a lot already. And to cooperate or not, it is the decision. But if we can assist them, we can con convince them to cooperate, it's good. But if not, it doesn't mean that we do not help them. We have to help them the same way because they are victims. If they think that they are human, they need help, we have to keep, we have to help them no matter they will cooperate or not. That's that as 
the second point. That's not the first point. Thank you. Thank you, Wan Chai. Sister Gabriella, if you could make one main recommendation from your chat with us today, what would that be? Avere la persona che ha sofferto la violenza della tratta al centro è person who has suffered due to human trafficking needs to be in the center, but not as an object. That person needs to be seen as a subject, a legal subject, and as such, that person needs to be listened to, and they need to be given the time so that they can build trust again, so that this traumatic experience can be entirely overcome. This trust needs not only to affect this individual, because it's not just one individual who has been destroyed by the experience, it's the entire fam family, the entire community that has been affected by this case of human trafficking. And they all deserve- um, Thank you, sister. I just want to say it's been a pleasure uh, to moderate these four outstanding panelists. I, I think there's a lot of great things that we can all take away from this panel today so we can be better and more effectively serve victims and, and help in the scourge of human trafficking. Uh, I, I want to particularly thank, in addition to our outstanding panelists, the OSCE staff who have just been wonderful to work with and have just done a fantastic job and getting this conference together. I, it's one of the best organized conferences that I've ever participated in. So many, many thanks to them. So thanks to all of you. And the OSCE conference will resume tomorrow with panel four at 1500 Vienna time. Enjoy the rest of your days. And I've enjoyed sharing this hour and a half with all of you. Thank you, Chris. Thank, Thank you. you to everybody. It was nice to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Gabrielle. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. And goodbye, one chai. Bye-bye, <laughs> Pam.